talking talking back. back. Welcome to Decision Decision Space, Space. the only show to take place right here in the space between the turns in your favorite games. I'm Brendan Hansen. I'm Jake Friedman. And this is the podcast about decisions in games. And today we are doing a push your luck pot pari of sorts where we'll be doing reviews of can't stop and spots and then getting into a discussion of the mechanic that is push your luck and in that discussion there'll likely be lots of other examples of push your luck games that we think excel or maybe don't work as well and why it should be a great conversation i can't wait to dive in yeah i'm really excited for this one too jake we haven't covered a ton of push your luck games on the show in the past And I think part of that is because in some ways we felt like we weren't quite sure how to approach taking our normal decision space lens and applying it to games of this genre. In some cases, maybe it felt like they were too light to get our, our the full depth that we needed in a conversation uh, to make a full deep dive of, say, a game like Can't Stop. Or in other cases, maybe... We just didn't feel that it would appeal in the same way that it would to other genres. But there's a lot of good games in this genre, a lot of interesting games in this genre, and the types of decisions that are offered in this genre is so different than a lot of the games that we typically cover. So I think both of us are really excited to delve in. Should we start with Can't Stop? Yeah, I was going to ask, is there any housekeeping we need to take care of here at the top? I know coming up next, we're going to have Arc Nova for our pre- mm. pre-planners. That'll be coming up soon. Uh, our patrons have selected food chain magnates we know those two games are on the horizon not next week but in the near future so check those out if you want to get a little bit more out of those episodes when they come up thanks again to our patrons if you're interested we do have a patreon where we would be delighted if you chose to support the show you can get to that in the link in the description of this podcast or patreon.com slash decision space awesome thanks for that jake so with that that's Get right into Can't Stop. So Can't Stop is a game first published in 1980 and designed by Sid Saxon, an American game designer who's designed countless games and is pretty legendary for setting a lot of the groundwork around game design in the United States, sort of in that key period and one of the most active people, also known for Acquire, a really big game from that period as well. Do you want to give an overview of Can't Stop and its mechanisms, Jake, or do you want me to try to tackle that? Not too much going on here. In Can't Stop, players roll four dice, and then they will use those dice by creating pairs that enable you to move up this mountain. So for each value that you can roll on two dice between two and 12 represents a path to the top of a mountain. And every player has pegs, I guess, uh, that you'll be using to move up the mountain. So the way the game works is you roll dice. And let's say I can create a pair of two dice over here as a seven. And these other two dice adds up to be a nine then I get to move up one space on the seven path to the top and the nine path to the top. Then I get to either stop my progress there and pass the other player's turn, or as the name would imply, I can keep rolling to see if I can continue moving up those paths, or maybe I bust because I roll values that I'm not able to move up any of the paths that I've already started this turn. You can start three separate paths in one turn, And that would mean I bust and I go all the way back to the progress I was at when I started that turn. The first person to get to the top of three paths to the top of the mountain on three different tracks, that will be the winner of the game. And the game will stop right there in that very turn. And I think the only other rule that I would add is a really important tension in this game is multiple players can be pursuing the same path at the same time until a player completes it at which point all of the other players who didn't complete its progress are totally erased they'll never be able to achieve that path throughout the remainder of the game so there's a lot of to summit the first to summit is the one who gets to claim the path so that creates a lot of interesting tension uh, because as you're rolling them there's lots of things that you have to evaluate because of the the two value and the the higher and lower value paths are shorter because they're less likely to roll. It's less likely you're going to roll a 2 or a 12. A 2, you'd have to roll two ones. A 12, you'd have to roll uh, two sixes. So those are less likely to occur than being able to combine dice and the values that come out of them than a 7. So you have to move a shorter distance on those paths. So that's something you're evaluating when you're deciding what dice to go with for the three paths that you pursue. But you're also looking at 
your pro the progress your opponent has made towards a given path and trying to think through, is it worth it for me to move up this path to dedicate, dedicate my roles this turn, my opportunities towards going for it? Or am I just going to kind of concede early? And then if someone concedes a path early and isn't making progress, maybe you say, if you're ahead on it, oh, maybe I'm not going to, I'm just going to pursue other paths right now because no one's making progress towards it. So there's lots of good tension going on in a game of Can't Stop. Jake, I wrote down some highlights of things I love about Can't Stop. Maybe I could just start with one of those, which is my favorite thing about Can't Stop is there's just obscene comeback potential. <laughs> it feels like anything can happen so long as you have one turn left. Yeah. I mean, you can, I mean, you can't win from, like, yeah, you could literally win from zero in a single turn. Yeah. Right. If you get really, really lucky with your rolls. So that's exciting, you know, that there's not a lot of games that give players the ability to end the game on the first turn of the game. And that's actually one of the fun, exciting things about this genre in general, right? It just can allow for turns that are so obscenely good that would never work in another game. Yeah, I it can also allow for turns that are so obscenely bad that they'd almost never work in another game too. And I think that one of the sort of things about Can't Stop that's a ton of fun is when you're taking your turn and watching it play out, right? But a frustrating thing about Can't Stop for me is how much downtime there can be if someone else is having one of those banner turns. You're sort of just forced to sit there and watch as it just rains money on someone else uh, and it can be a little bit slow. But one I of totally disagree with that. Oh yeah, you like watching the tension? I think that's like probably the most fun I have in the game when mm. like somebody's having a great turn and other people in the table are like, oh yeah, it's pretty good, but you're like, you're gonna roll like one more time, right? And then they're <laughs> like, ooh, and the tension there. And if they do roll and then bust after making all that progress, that's devastating for them and thrilling for the rest of the table. So even though, yeah, it can be some downtime, it's getting more and more exciting on somebody else's turn with each subsequent roll because they're staking more on each roll. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that that's a good point. And the social element of like goading other people into rolling or even sometimes you can trick goad yourself into rolling. You've made a ton of progress uh, and then you make the decision like, oh, I've already progress say eight spots on the seven track should i stop yeah and the answer is probably yes but oftentimes early game right when there's even more options available you can trick yourself into thinking you should keep going because the chances that you hit something uh are pretty high despite the fact that you've already accomplished a lot so i think that one really fun thing about can't stop is the way that the odds around if you should push or not shift throughout the game. Because early on, there's so many valid spots and you have three dice that you can, you have three different paths that you can move up at once. So if you stay on just two of them, you know you can safely keep rolling. And I love in Camp Stop, Can't Stop that I get to take turns where I know I'm safe and then have turns where you know that you're taking an absurd risk. And then a lot in between and a lot of the game is about knowing when it's okay to push when you should push playing for to, to your lead or playing from behind and knowing when to do what uh, and i think that for me that makes some of the decisions a little bit more nuanced than it seems like they would be in a game that's almost nakedly mathematic yes like yeah i think we'll definitely get into more of that in in the mechanics of push your luck games but this game feels like of all the games we've ever covered on the show, like if like it feels like this should be one that is just like fully solvable, right? Like you could just have a computer that just told you exactly what you should be doing every time. And that would be what you should do. Okay, so I totally agree, Jake. I think that if all players were playing uh, sort of computer optimally, playing that way would be the way to play. But the fun thing about can't, can't Stop, right, is the second someone acts irrationally, makes a decision that they mathematically probably shouldn't have made, and it goes in their favor, then all of a sudden they get ahead. So that's yeah. part, of, part of the fun here, too, of why even if you just did play against a computer who is only making optimal decisions, you would probably still end up winning because so much the game is designed to reward risk-taking and pushing your luck at moments where like if you were just looking at the math you probably shouldn't and i think that that's what keeps the game spicy right if it could be reduced to like just stop rolling all of a sudden a lot of the excitement and fun and tension leaves the game so brendan are you making the case that because of different players who have agency in this game that might not 
fit with the mathematically probable thing to do that this game itself isn't solvable in any given situation by math. No, well, okay, that's a tricky question because I think there's strictly optimal things you should probably do in any given situation mathematically, right? In terms of expected value. But I think that who wins the game in Can't Stop is not always the person, right, who made the most mathematically optimal decisions every game. That person yeah. probably wins most of the games played, but they don't win every game played. Oh, and definitely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think we're on the same page. Okay, it's like, I mean, it's like poker or like blackjack, right? Where you you can make the best plays, but you might lose to a beginner who gets, you know, the nuts draw or hits a straight on the river or whatever. Sure, you know? e exactly. The one difference I think here is that because there's this race element, right? Where the first person to the top of a path, they erase the progress of each each other player and the game ends when you just when someone wins three pass i think that adds even more tension over maybe playing suboptimal moves compared to some of those games where you're just trying to maximize your profit over the period of play whatever that period is like if you if we were playing blackjack and it was a race to winning two hundred dollars i think the decisions start to change compared to if you were just playing strictly yeah. regular and that's probably also me tricking myself a little bit like it's think, probably not true I, th but I think the probability definitely changes based on the situation in the game like right the math would tell you okay your opponent is one step away from victory on the seven track we need to keep rolling forever on this turn because it's so likely we'll lose i think the case i'm making with can't stop is it's like very much a solvable game like any sure. given state there would be somebody would be able to like create a computer program that could be very rudimentary that would tell you like you should roll you should choose to these two tracks you should roll again you should stop rolling here that's kind of what i'm saying which i think it which makes... i think is absolutely true okay all right so we are yeah. on the same page. we're on the same page yeah, yeah. but what does awesome. that mean for the game like is that fun I think that one of the benefits of Can't Stop is that it's not always immediately obvious what you should do. And you can't always make the optimal decision if you want to have a chance to win because of what you're talking about with endgame pressure, right? Sometimes, with it, immediately within any given turn, if you are racing someone on a track, oftentimes, even if just probabilistically, it looks like you should stop, yeah. sometimes the answer is you can't. And other times, what will make for even more interesting That would make it still the optimal decision to keep going, but yes. with low probability of succeeding. Of succeeding. And the thing that becomes even more interesting because of the pursuing multiple tracks in Can't Stop is sometimes you'll be racing with someone on a, a particular track. Let's say track number six, and you are maybe a few slots away from completing that one. But at the same time, you've made a ton of progress on two other tracks or one other track. And let's say one other track for the sake of this example. So then you're, it, you know that if you can just finish the six, you'll can, you could beat the other person's progress. But if you bust, you would lose your progress on both the six track, probably giving it to your opponent and the other track. And having to decide if that's worth it can be a little bit more nuanced and a little bit more interesting. Yeah. And I think the obvious point here is that like we are not computers sure, and sure, the yeah. perfect optimal play falls well outside like my capacity to do math and calculate that. But like that effect of that, it's like a purely probabilistic game does something interesting to the decision space. Yeah, I think. Right. Where it's like, oh, wow, if I was better at math, I'd be able to know what to do a little bit better here. Definitely. And getting better at the game and somewhat feels like, Jake, you're learning to intuit the probabilities of the game and the likelihood of how many more turns there'll be, which is really kind of fuzzy math of it, there isn't really an answer. There, there might be like a vague answer. Depending, but it depends on the decisions people make. Yeah. So knowing when you want to shift from pursuing maybe the inside tracks to the outside tracks. And, and I think that mm -hmm. the more I play Can't Stop, the more I realized there was more to learn than it initially seemed. Yeah. And there are fun like psychological things that you can kind of play with where it's like, oh, my opponent busted the first time. Now I've got a decent turn going. Maybe I stop earlier than I normally would just because now there's like more pressure on them and they might go crazy and bust again. You know, like yeah. it, it messes with your with your like human psychology in that way too. So, yeah. Brendan, did you do ratings for these games? I didn't do ratings, but I, I'm happy Let's to rate do them off the Let's cuff. Let's do it. Yeah, off that's good. Do you want to go first? Or do you want me to? Yeah, I did rating. I'm prepared. 
Oh my gosh. Put, can we put Twilight Zone music in? I didn't do like a slogan. I just oh, okay. came up with a number. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah. Okay, for no, me. No, let's do it at the same time. Okay, three, two, two one, one, seven. Eight. Okay. Okay. Seven feels right for me. I mean, I think this is a pretty fun game. Very simple, very quick playing, but it's to me, it's not like the most interesting thing in the world, right? It's not like it, it you know, it, it's very much in that like this is a 1980s game. Yeah. It feels kind of like Yahtzee. I think it's a lot more fun than Yahtzee personally, but it's not like what I would be holding up today is like, this is like the best game that could exist. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I I think that that's definitely right in my book too, Jake, but I will say Can't Stop does what it's trying to do so well that it bumps up a little bit for me. And it's so light and easy to play, especially I'm probably giving a one point bump for it digitally that I just need to address that bias. So maybe... If I had only played on the table, I'd come out on a seven two. Um, but I find it's it's it does it, it accomplishes a lot pretty quickly, except for the games that go off the rails and end up being way longer than they have any reason to be. Um, but I think can't stop most of the time. The juice is worth the squeeze because the high moments can be so high. Totally, uh, like the comeback factor is there, and it's just a lot of zany fun. So it's memorable, and I think it does what it's trying to do really well. We- yeah, it's it's like a game I would never turn down sure, to play of, sure. but I would also probably never recommend. <laughs> you yeah, know, like I'm not I'm not going to be like let's definitely like break out can't stop. But and if I think somebody's that- like, hey, join my board game arena game. Uh, you know, I'm there. <laughs> and I no, totally. And I think for me, I tilt slightly more towards every once in a while I'm I'm gonna be hankering for can't stop You're the can't asking stop for it to come out. Yeah. All right. Well let's compare and contrast that with new hotness spots designed by Alex Haig, uh, who also designed games like monikers wavelength yeah yeah okay so they're the publishers at cymk is alex haig and justin vickers so justin vickers and alex haig have design credits on monikers and wavelength all and then because they're part of cymk who publish spots and then they design spots with john perry the designer of air land and sea and time barons and other well-known games like that all right gotcha uh and spots is a game where you're going to be trying to complete dog cards which the dog cards are essentially recipes that require specific diet values to be completed. So a card might require a one, a three, and a five. Or it might be four dice, or it might be just one dice. So there's quite a bit of variability in how difficult these recipes are to achieve. On your turn, you will be picking one of, is it six? Six. Six trick cards. that, And these trick cards are tell you to do different things with the dice it might say roll two dice and then roll another dice after that after you've placed those first two or it might say roll all the dice or roll eight dice and choose a value beforehand and only place the dice of the value that you chose and there's kind of a wide assortment of these effects and one of the cool things is that you won't use all the trick effects in one game so that offers some variability play to play that's kind of like a maybe a more modern innovation on something can't stop was doing which is always the exact same game experience every single time there are some other quirky rules in there around uh the way busting works is if you can't place a dice it goes into your doghouse and once you have a value higher than seven in your doghouse then you lose all dice on dogs that haven't been like completed and there's also a mechanic called like bones where you can get bone car or bone tokens and that allows you to re-roll dice when you've activated a trick and i think that's by and large kind of covers it maybe we should talk about how the you actually like complete a dog so basically on your turn you can choose whether to do a trick or complete all your filled recipes and you'd flip those dogs over and they're done and you win by completing six dog cards and you can also complete them by having all of your dog cards currently in play filled with dice that then they are automatically flipped over which gives you basically a free turn you don't have to waste your turn doing that and one of the reasons why you might not always just do that is that there's another mechanic that's always on called howl it's just one of the tricks that's always going to be there that lets you add another card uh, of the dog cards to what you're pursuing so there's 
a bit of flexibility within the game system of how many different values you might be able to place out of dice rolled in a given roll. Because as you use this HAL trick, you can pull more cards in and then you're trying to complete more dogs at once, which makes it harder to complete them all at once and score score in one go automatically. But it does mean you're more likely to roll the values that do come out because you have more spots just naturally. Hey, look at that, spots. Nice. So what are our key points on this one, Brendan? I see you have quite a few in the notes. We should start with that. It's adorable, you know? It, it's The art here is just incredible. It's a good-looking dog game. The dogs are cute. There's one dog that has a just requires a one dice, and it's Brendan... You can imagine guess, where it is. It's, where it's is it? butthole. Oh, no. <laughs> Bert, no. <laughs> so I think Spot's presentation is undeniably incredible. It's one of the like most charming little games in a box I've seen in a long time. The bone tokens that you referenced, Jake, are actual little bone pieces that are really cute. And the cards themselves that make up the tricks are all die cut different shapes too, which I think is is fun that they're not just like simple regular poker cards or something or even tarot cards, but there's more going on with those as well. So it's really charming. It's also tactical because of the different tricks that are all available and the fact that when someone else uses them, uh, no one else can use them for that given round. You use five of them and then they all get flipped up again. And then the one that didn't get picked gets a bone tree added to it as an incentive for someone to use it in the future. I think that that creates a much more nuanced somewhat more interactive push your luck environment where the decisions that are being juxtaposed aren't always the same and why you're choosing to pick something might not always be to help yourself but it might be to hinder your opponent's progress uh so it ends up being a little bit more thinky than can't stop where you don't have a decision point your decision point in can't stop is just always to roll the dice here you're trying to decide how you want to roll the dice what dice you will get to use etc yeah and i think that is the key difference for me between the two games and something that I want to hone in on as we have this conversation around the push your luck mechanic, which is the way that it intersect, like the way push your luck intersects with the size of a decision space, mm. because the decision space size here is significantly bigger than in can't stop and can't stop. You have one action, right? You're always rolling your dice and then you're just choosing what to do. Here you have six different things that you could do that gives you a different way to roll dice. Or in some cases, they don't roll dice at all. We'll talk about that in one second. So that already is like six times bigger on its surface. And then you have similar type of, you know, a decision tree from there about what you're doing with those dice placement you know, are you going to re-roll? Some of the tricks allow you to like continue to roll, push, you know, can't stop style until you choose to stop. So it's just a way, way bigger decision space. And to me, I think that inter th that interaction is challenging with the push your luck mechanic. I think that mechanic works much better when the decision space is small and it is boiled down to a really you know, a decision that you can quickly come to about, I want to keep going or I want to stop, you know, like the yeah. faster you can get to that point, because that's the, the fun of push your luck is do I push my luck here or do I not the better? And I feel like spot just has too many steps to get to that. Like the fun of that is subverted by other mechanisms in the game that are adding variability, right? It's, but at what cost? For me, spots feels a lot like an efficiency puzzle with push your luck dice rolling as a core mechanism. But it's but I wouldn't even maybe call it explicitly a push your luck game because of all the decisions offered to you, which I think some people might kind of guffaw at. Like, what do you mean spots isn't a push your luck game? And I know it is. It's a push your luck game. But so much of the decisions emphasize finding an efficient path through the the tricks that are there, maybe trying to collect these bones slash treats that are available so that you can use those to almost ignore the push your luck puzzle. Jake, the more we've played, the more we've kind of leaned towards finding ways to build up a ton of tricks and then just use those tricks to kind of create a win condition. You mean bones? Bones, excuse me. Get all those bones to build up enough of them that you can just re-roll where it's almost a win condition that you have so many bones. It's like you have uh, inevitability at exactly. that point. Yeah. And that's to me why it feels like an efficiency puzzle almost more than a push your luck, at least in part. Yeah, I think that is a problem. We've been kind of calling it 
the like a, the big bone strategy, strategy. right yeah. where by the time you have eight you can re-roll eight times or whatever sometimes way more than that it's really plausible that if you have just a few if you have all six of your dog cards out because you're taking the howl action when it's available to you that you can win by filling six dog cards in a single turn and even if your opponent has been you know going slow and steady right get you know a few dogs here or there it it feels like the big bone strategy is just like a a way better way like it feels like it is goes just as fast as like the slow and steady and mm. also doesn't have any risk because you have like that inevitability of like being able to reroll basically as much as you want so we've just found that to be a little bit over centralizing of a strategy in our games yeah which i think has let some of the luster on this one uh come off for me i will also say jake just generally there's something about the affordances in this game this is a concept that i think we're going to talk a lot in the back half of the show which is coming up very quickly where we talk more about mechanisms of push your luck in general but i want to bring this concept out here and what i mean by that is how much can you sort of mess up on your way to busting before you actually bust right like what's the amount of the game kind of lets you fudge it before it says okay you've busted now you lose your progress and in can't stop one interesting thing about that is your first roll you're never going to bust it's early game at the very least right you're always going to roll something maybe later in the game you will but your affordance is really high and then if you only go up on two tracks you know almost certainly if no one's claimed any of the other tracks you're going to be able to make progress on another so again your affordance is really high of when you could bust and something about spots that affordance feels a lot tighter and i think that also is what makes it feel more puzzly to me around if i should be pushing my luck or not so much of it feels a little bit more obvious of oh i just can't push my luck here because almost certainly I'm going to bust. So I just have to take a, a safe option or try to choose something that will, a, a trick that will just not force me to bust. I, it just feels less flexible. It feels too tight in the affordances it gives you around push your luck. I think that intersects with the bone strategy in a sure. really unfun way because yeah, on one hand, yes, I totally agree. It, it feels like so easy to bust on, you know, your first or second roll. And if you're just cl- trying to collect bones and get all six dog cards as fast as you can, like you just don't care about busting at all in the same way that the, uh, a player that's like maybe going a more, I don't know, traditional path through the game <laughs> does care about busting because like I'm going to, I'm trying to complete all my dog cards in a single turn. So I just need yeah. like, you know, to get a big roll and you know, what, so two turns away from winning, I just want to roll a lot of dice and I have six dogs that are completely empty. So there's a good chance that I'll be able to just get a decent amount of them covered right there. And then I'm trying to win the turn after that. And I have, you know, 10 bones to spend re-rolling. Yeah. So you just don't care about busting at all. And I think like where the game wants you to p- push your luck to be. And this is what I felt in my first play before I kind of started figuring it out is in that decision of like, do I roll at all or do I take my progress with completed dogs? And the more I play mm. it, the more it feels like wasting a turn to complete a single dog is just like pretty bad. The incentive isn't quite there. It's just not yeah. quite. Ro- something's not quite working for me. So anyway, my rating for this one is a four. What about you? Mine's like a six. I think it's so charming and beautiful. And I think if I'm looking for kind of a, an efficiency puzzle, it's kind of in that realm, but it's a little, it's just too long. It's too long for me, Jake, for what it mm-hmm. offers. Cool. All right. Well, anything else to say on spots or can't stop? I think w- the final note that I'll give on spots before we move to the mechanical deep dive and then maybe it'll come up again. It's just, I really do appreciate the variety that's in spots. I love the different cards that can come in and out and how no two games are going to be quite the same if you're playing with randomized tricks. And I think that's a breath of fresh air compared to a lot of push your luck games in the genre where they're a little bit more rigid in some cases than that. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. All right. Well, let's jump into the second half of the episode where we're going to talk about push your luck more generally. You invoked blackjack earlier, Jake, and I think that I kind of want to start there because in some ways, you know, a lot of modern game mechanisms are feel like novel innovations. Something like worker placement feels like it was plucked from the ether at some point in time and kind of came into be fairly recently or deck building. 
Uh, but push your luck is a, a genre, a, a game mechanism, an idea that goes back a really long time because of things like blackjack. And actually, in Kinesia, Reiner Kinesia wrote this book called Dice Games Properly Explained in 1999, um, which I fortunately have a copy of. And he Throughout that book, there's a section where he kind of tries to categorize different types of dice games that exist. And one of the sections he calls Jeopardy dice games. And those are the type of dice games that I think fit this sort of push your luck idea. So I wanted to read that as a that little description of Kinesia in Dice Games Properly Explained of Jeopardy dice games as a, as a jumping off point. Would that be okay with you, Jake? Yeah, sounds great. Okay, so here's what Kinesia says about Jeopardy dice games, which we're using as a stand-in for Push Your Luck. You focus on progressing and maximizing your results, but the stakes are rising. If you go wrong, you lose it all. Great risks bring great rewards or utter defeat. Disaster strikes in many different ways. More than ever, you need to weigh up potential gains and losses. Rolling specific numbers or reaching certain totals may catch you out. You see disaster looming, but can you escape? Other games allow you to continue throwing as long as you keep your options open. Know when to stop and secure your results, but if you get too greedy and your luck fails, you are out. You need to make the right decisions and be lucky too. I think that's a great description of sort of the, you know, I think he's really describing the decision space that yeah. players are operating in when they're playing a push your luck dice game in particular. But of course, the same type of decision space would exist in a card game or a board game using this mechanism too yeah and i just love too that this little description of as kinesia calls them jeopardy dice games ends with you need to make the right decisions and be lucky too i think that sort of encapsulates the genre and the expectations that you bring to it of sort of the magic circle that you're going to create when you sit down to play that maybe don't exist if you're going to sit down and play a strategy euro game right is it yeah Right. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely that's true. Of I don't all know. Games, right. I don't know. Right. I was gonna say, I don't know if there's definite there's not there's nothing about push your luck that says this has to be more random than another type of game. You know, I'm thinking about like poker or magic or, or some of these card games that we know have a really high element of luck, too. Yeah. But I think the thing with push your luck that is different is that that luck is so like you the feedback from the luck you're getting is hitting you over the head right mm -hmm. it's you know it's i just busted in that one moment because i got such a dreadfully bad roll like there was almost no chance i was gonna bust and can't stop on that turn can you believe i rolled four ones you know like that type of thing is so obvious in push your luck where you can get like just as dreadfully unlucky in a different board game that has like some element of luck maybe drawing cards from a deck but it's not typically all happening at once right it's like drawing bad or rolling poorly over the course of the game that's still inputting a lot of luck a lot of elements of luck but it's like parceled out more slowly yeah definitely i think that what you just said jake made me realize that we'd be remiss in this conversation not to just make it very clear that you know busting is a core part of this genre right I think if you take out busting, in some ways you don't have push your luck. Uh, I think that's really important, right? Like the sense of loss is in part what gives these games so much excitement, the potential for excitement, because we're all really loss averse as humans. It's just built into our psychology, right? So the cool thing about push your luck games is the emotional feedback or the emotional response that they elicit from that immediate feedback of, oh, you have this thing or you almost have this thing. Are you greedy? Do you want more of this thing? Or is that enough? And oftentimes we want more of the thing and then we lose it all. So it's this, it almost, it, it just invokes in me CT win like games agency as art. The like the practice of like exploring emotionally hubris and greed and risk aversion and risk assessment all at once. There's a lot going on emotionally in push your luck games that come to the forefront of the decision space in a way that it doesn't always as clearly come forth in other genres and i think that that's something that's so fun and interesting about these games that they yeah they're so good at producing emotions in ways that uh a lot of other genres aren't yeah and i think even you know there, there's a lot of games that have risk mitigation or risk assessment in some form which is clearly a big part of push your luck but yeah i think you nailed it when you talk about busting I'm thinking of an example of that is Bruges or Hamburg, mm. where you have the threat tokens that are rolled over the course of the game and players have the choice. Like, do I want to deal with these threat tokens or 
do I want to, you know, take the chance that if a five or six is rolled on the purple dice next turn, then I'm going to lose the effect or then I'm going to, you know, take the punishing effect of that risk, that threat triggering. Whereas that game could be designed very similarly in which you have, you're getting these threat tokens and at the end of the game, it's just like negative points for how many threat tokens you have. And that would feel so different than the impact of having it. Okay, but you have to have three of these and then it triggers, right? Then you busted. It really does something different to the game. And I think in a way that's, for me, really fun. Yeah, I, I agree, Jake. I think, okay, we talked about blackjack. Let's go back to it. So what makes for interesting decisions in push your luck games? I think I would argue blackjack does not have interesting decisions, right? Blackjack is a game where you should just play the book as prescribed to you to, to maximize your chance of winning, right? Like there's really clear probabilities that you should just do and you will most likely optimally perform in, in blackjack. I don't know how you can say that and give can't stop an eight. Like what? they're just... They're the same. Like they're both, (laughs) it's like the same. It's just doing probabilities. I think the difference though is the racing to the end changes your assessment in Can't Stop versus Blackjack, right? Sure. Because you can erase other people's progress. Like if I could, if I- I, Okay, I see. Like the the probabilities change over the course of the game in a more dynamic way. In Blackjack, you just want to play every single hand independently of anything else. Right. Like if I, if it was a race to winning the first 10 hands of blackjack, and then I get to take $500 from you, that changes the, my decisions around what I would do or it doesn't, but it feels like it would. I don't know. I think it's also the three tracks that come into play somewhat too and can't stop. And yeah. you're assessing these different pursuits. Yeah. I would rather play can't stop than, than blackjack, blackjack too. But like we have, we should be clear. They're operating in like very a similar, similar space. space. No, for sure. Okay, but then the question is, what makes for interesting decisions in push a lot games then? If we're going to go back to the frame of our show, looking at that, I have a few bullet points and I'm just going to read some of them out and then maybe we can delve more deeply into some some of them. So I think like fuzziness around when to stop in variable amounts throughout the game is important, right? Can't stop achieves that by having your turn be an opportunity that you could win and not knowing how many more turns you'll get the loss of progress incentives to continue to push or stop, I think are both important, right? If you don't have something else you're considering stop spots does that by when you fill up all of your dogs, you automatically achieve them. You have some Mm -hmm. incentive to continue to push. And I think variety is really important. Like you can't, I mean, and can't stop you do, but it's nice when you're not always making the exact same type of decision. So like variable inputs, or variable outputs, the reward you're getting is shifting how much you could potentially get in the pot. Say more about this. Like, what's an example of this? I'm kind of lost. Which I, part? I think I disagree with you okay. on the variable input and output, but... I, I think so. For me, one thing that's kind of fun is in a game like a game like Ink and Gold, how mm-hmm. the pool of things that you're potentially pursuing is shifting throughout the course of the game. So what you stand to lose is shifting. And then also based on how many people are there, what you stand to gain are shifting too. Okay. So Ink and Gold, everyone in Can't Stop, you know, you're rolling for yourself. You're trying to pursue yeah. your own progress on the track. And in Ink and Gold, it's almost as if you The roles are for everyone, but you get to choose if you're going to be a part of the roles or not. Uh, That's your core decision in the game. Are you going to leave the temple while more treasure gets flipped? And I think that that shared pursuit is kind of interesting. And it gives a variety to the inputs because how much you could stand to gain shifts and how much you could stand to lose shifts. Yeah, I don't know that that's that different from Can't Stop where you're like out the output is changing also because of like you gained this much progress. I think that's that's fair. Yeah. Okay. All right. Then I agree. I mean, I think I think that's really important one, and it might be difficult to think of uh, one that doesn't have that, at least in some some form or another. But yeah. maybe that's a clear example then of why it's important to have. What about in Raw, Jake? So Raw is an auction game by Kinetia where more tiles come out. And the push your luck in this game is that a round can end because enough Raw tiles come out that the round ends immediately. So there's tension around how much you should pay for a given pot based on how many how many more auctions you think could be in the round and potentially even more push your luck if you're the last person left in the round. Um, I think that game is doing a good job of giving an example of variable inputs and outputs, right? 
because in some cases there it's it's abstracted even more there is pusher luck because some of it is around will there be better pots uh, better auctions better lots that will come in the future that i should save my purchasing power for uh, and how much purchasing power i have is variable because of the sun disk that i have the money that i have so i think it just it's the same puzzle and it shifts in the same way but what i have to spend and what i am spending it on is always different and that's what keeps it fresh so that's i guess where i'm saying variable inputs and outputs can help make for interesting decisions you're not always making the same type of decision yeah sure Raw is such an interesting example because when I talk about raw in pusher luck, I think I'm thinking almost exclusively about the situation where you're the only person left with sun mm. disks and then you're making the true like core pusher luck decision of do I keep at adding things to the pot even when if I flip over another raw tile, I'll lose everything, right? Yeah. And that's a clear example of that every time you re-roll and grab another tile, you stand to lose more uh, if you pull that raw tile out and trying to figure out when I have enough that I'm happy with this pot versus like this pot isn't that great. So it's worth it to me to to take the risk to get something else more. I mean, yeah. that to me is like, that's push your like goodness right there. And it's amazing how well that fits into a larger game of raw where you can play raw and win and never even be in that situation where you're like really playing a push your luck thing yeah but at the same time you know the feedback isn't as immediate but if you if a round ends and you haven't spent all your sun discs that round you've kind of busted on spending those sun discs right yeah. because you've given up the opportunity to buy lots that you could have gotten that would give you tiles and you don't feel it as immediately as say the end of that game of raw or busting in a game of can't stop but i do think it's playing in a similar space where you're losing the opportunity to pursue sure. that I, I see what you're saying like okay i could bid for this lot or I'm pushing my luck that there's going to be a better, a better lot, lot to use my 12 on in the future later in this round. Yep, exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I hear you. I think I guess that's push your luck. I don't know. It feels it feels a little I it's think it's not a I Jeopardy think, dice game. That's for sure. It's not a Jeopardy dice game. Yeah, I, I'm struggling with that because it feels like the type of calculation you're making there is a very similar to the type of calculation you you make in any like euro efficiency game like in the castles of burgundy like i want this tile and this tile uh i think i i maybe i want this ship a little bit more but i think nobody else is going to take it where i know they'll take this other thing so i'm going to push my luck and hope it comes back to me but yeah. i don't feel like castles of burgundy is a push your luck game at all yeah but i do think so what about games jake where there's like I'm just going to use Enchanted Plumes, right? Like there are times in that game where there's a shared tableau of cards. Maybe I will push my luck with that a little bit where it plays in the same space of leaving a card out there that I don't want you to take into your hand and deny it from me. Lost Cities would be another good example. Would you count sort of that like, I'm using the tableau as an extension of my hand to kind of cheat a little bit and I don't want someone to take it. And if you do, I lose. To me, that feels a little bit like push your luck, right? Because I'm kind of thinking of it as like, I have this. It's kind of mm -hmm. like my progress on a can't stop thing until I lock it in. And when I swap, I've locked it in. But by taking it, I've like busted on that potential future outcome. I, I yeah, I don't know. For me, I think it might be less helpful to categorize all these instances as push your luck in a game. To me, if that feels more like, like it, it's definitely risk taking and risk assessment. Yeah. But I don't know that all instances of risk taking and risk assessment in game is push your luck. I think Great. maybe, you know, like all push your luck is risk taking and risk assessment, but it doesn't necessarily work the other way. Right. Yeah. Like there's no, there's Busting. no like, I'm going to keep going. Yeah. You know, yep. like it, it's almost like if, if another turn of another player is happening in between, then you're almost getting into like a different space. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. That similar feelings are evoked. It's coming from the same sort of decision space, but the because it's mechanically different enough, it's drifted away. I think that's really fair. One more just clear, maybe clearer example to kind of clear up some of the differences would be like if there's like a shared objective in a Euro game that like mm -hmm. everybody's trying to go for. Yep. Moving in another avenue, I'm like increasing the risk that somebody else is going to be the one to claim that objective before me. And if I'm just like going straight for it and passing up other opportunities, but I don't think 
these are push your luck games. Yep. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. I think that, that that makes a ton of sense. And I appreciate you laying it out like that. The final thing that I want to add to that list of what might make for interesting decisions and push, push your luck games is that the affordances are well tuned, right? So like a game has to allow you to push your luck enough, but not allow you to push your luck so much that that's always the optimal choice. And having that variety in terms of how much the game offers you in terms of busting can add texture to the game and make it interesting. So if someone was designing a push your luck game, thinking of the affordances around busting as like your most valuable design knob, I think is a key starting point, right? So in raw, an example is like how many spaces are there on that track? How many raw tiles can get drawn before a round is over? That's the knob in a game of raw. And can't stop, the knob is how many different things you can juggle at once, how many paths are going, that sort of thing. Yeah, I think it's a that's a great point. I haven't played Raw with not using the appropriate rules of how far you can advance, well, but, but it does feel perfectly calibrated at the yeah. different player counts. Yeah. You know, because if if it was shorter by a space or even two spaces, then you probably don't ever get into that situation where everybody's kind of like chanting, come on, like raw, 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 as somebody's like trying to make their final pot as big as possible. And everybody else is hoping they draw raw tiles out of the stack because it would already be over. Like right. by the time it gets to that point, or if it was two spaces further, then at the end of the round, it probably always is end by somebody completely filling up their row with, yep. you know, whatever the good, the good type of tiles are. Yeah, so I think that's the knife edge a lot of these games are balanced on, is how yeah. well those affordances are turned, tuned. I agree with a lot of these. Like, the fuzziness is key. And, I mean, push your luck is so tied to probabilities that in a lot of these games, it's like you want, like, a probability chart. Like, yeah. can't stop, you. I keep saying this, but you really feel like you should just be, like, looking at, like, okay, what are the odds again that you roll a four out of, if I roll four dice, that two of them will be added together to be a four? Like having just a table of probabilities in front of you when you played that game would feel helpful. Yeah. And that I think that says a lot about like, you know, how maybe not fuzzy it is. But the fuzziness, as you t keep pointing out, is coming from player interaction, right? The way yep. I don't know how aggressive Brendan's going to be. Maybe I need to keep going because he's crazy and he's going to win on his next turn or, or whatever. Sure. I think another game that does it even better than can't stop with with enabling player interaction to create the fuzziness is rapido or rapido or escape escape the reiner canizia so spelled e-x-c-a-p-e escape yeah the reiner canizia push your luck game where you basically have to roll you roll two dice and these are wonky dice that don't have the normal values on them uh and then you combine them with the higher value being the big number and the lower value being the small number. So I roll a five and a three, then my value is 53. And you get to choose where you want to put your 53 on to like kind of like a stair step path. So I could say I put it on the three and that means if it gets back to my turn and nobody's bumped me, then I get to move three spaces down the track and you're racing to the end of the track. But if on Brendan's turn, he rolls a 54 and puts his uh, dice below mine anywhere on that track, then I'm bumped out because a higher value has been put below me. So that creates like a really fun uh, sense of challenge of like, how are my opponents going to play this? Uh, and they're going to play it differently based on where I am at the board. So I feel like for me, that puts that like kind of fuzziness of player interaction more to the fore in the decision making in a really fun way than in Can't Stop. And at the same time, it's like making it, it, it keeps that decision like very small. Like yeah. the decision space in that game is so small. You never have any decision other than like, do I put this in like the zero through six slot? Mm -hmm. And I think for me, like in push your luck games, keeping the decision space small is the the way to go because then I get to actually play with the probabilities, right? That's when I'm actually able to engage with the push your luck compared to a game like spots where I'm actually not really engaging with the push your luck. I'm engaging with like the 
efficiency and like all the other stuff that's like in my mind is like sort of just like should be the toppings on the main course which i think helps accomplish some of the other things that help push a luck game stay engaging like by having it leads to less downtime like a, a potential pitfall pitfall of the genre is that you could have too much downtime for how much meat there is on your turn and it can also help with it maybe not being too long though i would argue that rapido for other reasons can end up being really really fast and short or really really long in a way that isn't necessarily ideal basically the problem with this game is it has a player it has like six players on the box and it should not sure yeah because yeah. then yeah that that was crazy when you there was a at our at geekway there was like a six player game of this and then there's just not enough spots so you just like yeah. on your turn you don't have any choice at all about where to like put your dice sure because you can't put it on the same spot as somebody else so that was just like that was kind of like on the publisher in my mind which you know that that's yeah i think that that, that can happen but with can't with push alert games in general that don't have gates around when the game ends i think in one of the things that can happen is because of the randomness of the way the systems are built a lot of times is there can be a lot of variance in the length of games which is just something i wanted to highlight. totally oh i think that's a great point even can't stop sometimes you're yep. just like, when is this going to end? Because everybody's yep. busting. Yeah. I think another thing, the genre ends up being pretty approachable if it's built around these really simple decisions in a way that I think is a, a real highlight of the genre and something that can produce a lot of fun factor is a lot of these games can be games you can play with anyone because enough of it's intuitive enough and the decisions aren't so complex that it's asking too much that you can almost sit down and play with anyone. So for me, thinking about push out games from that perspective invoke things like Deep Sea Adventure, the Oint game by Jun Sasaki and Goro Sasaki, uh, that's about pushing your luck against other players' actions as much as the, the game itself, right? Um, and that's one where you want to play it lots. And I think that one's fairly approachable too. Yeah, I, I think the approachable point is a good one because at its core, you know, these games are a fun way to gamble with your friends and gambling is something that most people grow up experiencing in one way or another right yeah you know getting back to kind of like the agency of this type of game like like that type of agency like oh i know this agency we're gambling is uh i think that's something that's like really clear to a lot of people compared to like maybe a euro game that's like the agency we're experiencing this game is like contract fulfillment (laughs) it's like okay what's that about you know i don't automatically have like the a frame of reference right that necessarily in the same way yep and depending on the frame of a push your luck game like can't stop it's almost like you know the the running down a hallway where you have a door that's stop and a door that's go and you just that's the decision you just go left door right door left door right door and I think that that simple structure can be a lot of fun. Jake, you mentioned having more things later upon can be really tricky. I think a game that a lot of people argue does it really well and does it right is Quacks of Quedlinburg, which layers purchasing decisions or what goes in your bag on top of the game that just adds enough of a, a little bit of fuzziness around what you might pull, uh, but also about what you're trying to pull that people really love. And then a game that came to mind for me that I've played a bunch and don't love that adds a little bit too much um, it certainly had its time is king of tokyo richard garfield's 2011 push up game kind of styled around yahtzee uh in its core mechanisms i think that game there's a really fun core no surprise because it's built around yahtzee but a lot of the energy system and the buying of upgrades and cards ends up kind of distracting from the core of what's so fun there for me that it starts to fall apart in terms of wanting to go back to that well for me yeah and to be clear i think i'm talking about what i'm looking for in this game sure I don't for sure be- yeah. begrudge anyone for lo- loving spots it's a popular game people really dig it uh i've seen a lot of love for it online and in our discord and but and i feel the same way with quacks of quedlinburg it's not for me but clearly it's a beloved game by many and more power to you but i i've only played it once and you know i, I felt the same issue with it where it felt like the game was it, the play i had was just really long and the fun part is pulling stuff out of your bag not sort of yeah everything between it and it did feel like the game kind of came down to like you know pulling stuff out of the bag as well so like why all the do we need all this set dressing i think for me the games that i like outside of the super simple ones and i do want to shout out a game called claim it that's like my Mm. absolute favorite in these like just dead simple core push your luck experiences this is one where you're trying to like claim spaces on a grid to basically score the largest contiguous area by the end of the game you can play it on yukata 
it's really simple, really fun. Highly recommend you check that one out. But I would say outside of those type of games, which I do enjoy, I like it when it's maybe a small piece of another game, but not of another bigger game, but not the whole game itself. So for me, Raw is a great example of that. You're not always doing this like push your luck puzzle, but it's really fun when it pops up in Raw. Another example of this is like in A Feast for Odin, which is obviously a massive game, but it has like a really small push your luck game in it, which is when you do the pillaging or fishing or whaling or hunting actions and you're rolling dice and you're allowed to re-roll it up to three times. And often, and there's ways to mitigate that dice roll by spending weapons or resources. So often you'll be posed with a question of like, I rolled a five, I can spend a bunch of wood and weapon cards to get that to a value where I like successfully achieve the action. Or I can roll again to hopefully get a cheaper cost. But if I roll a seven or eight, then I'll fail completely. And that's like a really fun, you know, quick decision. It's really easy to get to kind of the core of that decision, but it's packaged as part of a much larger game. And I think that can work really well too. I like that too, Jake, because it allows people who want to play that particular style to opt into it more or less. Uh, And there's other strategies you can pursue if you want to opt out of it. Though some people might argue in the base game that whaling's so strong, you should kind of pursue it if it's available. But for a different episode, uh, look up our Feast for Odin episode. Another game, we're kind of talking about games with push your luck elements now. We talked about Raw, Feast for Odin. Uh, a game that came to mind for me with that, Jake, recently that we've also covered on the show is Living Forest. A lot of uh, Living Forest is kind of driven by a push your luck system with the revealing of cards very much in like a blackjack style way. And the notable thing for me with Living Forest is that it, it achieves the fuzziness of output more or less by having flux in your deck. Uh, you could sit down and kind of do the math always and see what your probability of hitting something that would make you bust is. But I found in practice when you play that game, it's not like you're constantly counting the number of cards in your deck. And you you have a good sense for it, what, what you might hit that would be an out or what you might hit that would cause you to bust. But you don't always exactly know. And I think that that lends a lot of fun to that game. Uh, I mean, you, and- I think you want to know if you can't, bust you for sure want to know if you can like there are times when you're like okay i know all my you know whatever the black symbol Symbol. yeah is all all those cards are in my discard pile already so i might as well draw my whole flip the deck yeah yeah i do you know what that's such an interesting example because i really like that game and i feel like it is a game that kind of fits in with quacks where the push your luck is like a big part of it but there's also almost like an equivalent part of it outside of that I wonder if part of the reason this one works for me better is because instead of output randomness, like after doing stuff, it's input randomness. Like it determines what you can do on mm. your turn. And and for whatever reason, like, you know, sequencing it that way to where I'm doing the push your luck and then I'm taking my turn feels a little bit more satisfying than taking my turn, doing all this stuff. And then like, oh, wait, it just it was for nothing because I at the end you know, didn't get the the right things out of my bag. Yeah. The, another game that I've played that I wanted to mention that uses actually a really similar to li- uh, system to Living Force is a game called Samurai Spirit. This is an Antoine Bauza co-op game that came out shortly after Ghost Stories. And it's driven by this blackjack style system where you're electing how many cards you want to flip and you're going to take damage, but also do damage to an, uh, opponents who are trying to raid your village. I don't think it's that, gr- it's not a great game. I d- I've owned it for a long time. I don't play it very often. But one thing that stuck with me about a novel innovation in this game is the way that it deals with affordances. So each of you are playing as a as a character and you have a front side and a back side and you're powered up when you get to your back side. And the way that you get to the back side of your power, you actually like transform into an animal version of yourself. It's kind of cool theming. Is by taking a certain amount of damage. So in that game, sometimes you have situations where you want to push to get just enough damage that you'll flip to this more powerful state. So it plays with this idea of like taking... D- damage busting more or less is bad and you're trying to get just enough of a bad outcome that it works out in your favor and trying to kind of ride at that edge so you're not always trying to like just do well or just do poorly you kind of want to manage the resource of doing well and poorly equitably at the right time which is 
maybe makes it sound even a little bit more interesting than it is. But I think that there's something there. Sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's something there in terms of there's ways to play with affordances that are part of a push luck game that aren't just bust or not bust that still play into the jeopardy and those same feelings. So I wanted to mention it. So again, that's Samurai Spirit in Antoine Bowser game that I don't recommend. Gotcha. Well, Brendan, as we get to the end of this episode, I'm wondering if you have any final thoughts on push your luck as a mechanism or push your luck games. I think the biggest thing for me is, you know, it's really interesting having an episode of Decision Space about Push Your Luck because it's a it's a timeless element the games have just gone back to forever. And it's so easy to see why, given the emotional response that they elicit. Uh, and, you know, I had a ton of fun playing Yahtzee growing up. And I think that a huge part of that was just like internalizing probabilities maybe isn't fun, but while you're doing it, it's sort of interesting. Uh, and as like... I don't know. There's just something about like knowing probabilities and then making judgment calls around them that is intrinsically fun. I don't ever want to do it for that long. And I definitely don't want to sit around what other people are doing it for that long. But I like making judgment calls and push your luck games are such a clear way that you can have interesting judgment calls set up in games that feel like the decisions, you know, like it's fun to have low stakes judgment calls where I'm not having an hour-long game that comes down to a judgment call. Uh, So I like that about these games. And I like judgment calls in other genres of games, like simultaneous decision games and things like that. But it's fun to have them in Push Your Luck. So I guess that's my kind of closing thought, is I I appreciate that it's a genre built around the decision of judgment calls. Yeah. I guess my final thoughts are... I agree that Push Your Luck is one of the most like accessible and good welcome points to gaming that we have. I think it's great for kids. Uh, I think it's you know great for welcoming new people into the hobby because it is so familiar. You made me think about my entry point to the modern board game hobby with Catan, and so much mm. of that early play is sort of starting to realize like, okay, yeah, we know that the sixes and eights are the best spaces to get to because they're rolled more often and you know a lot of that game comes down to really like internalizing the probabilities and that game makes it really easy for you by putting different dots on the on the actual tokens to tell you how you know likely or unlikely they are to be rolled but that's like really fun to sort of start understanding and i think it's a place where you can really feel yourself improving at a skill and then Mm. that translating into you know doing better at a game which for me is one of the most addictive and like best experiences that i have with games are those moments where i feel myself improving and i think that there's a little bit of a paradox is not the right word but it's interesting that push your luck games i think despite being games that have a very small decision space or maybe because they're games that have such a small decision space it's so fun to see yourself like push up against that ceiling of you know improvement right like i you can only get so good at this game because luck is always going to be such a heavy factor um, but it's still fun to improve at them and figure out ways that you can improve and i think that because of the, the smallness of that space every time i'm like figure out just like a small angle of like wait I should be making this decision at this point in the game and can't stop over this other one. Even though I'm, you know, it's not going to make you win every single game. Just like finding those little moments in games as small as this are just so thrilling for me. So, I mean, I think that's what keeps me coming back to these games and this genre of games. Which I think speaks to the other thing you called out, Jake, about the immediateness of the feedback in this genre of games too, which is which is awesome. It's fun to feel things and push all games let you feel them in spades. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for listening to this week's episode of Decision Space. We want to make an appeal for reviews. We'd be delighted to read out a review from the show, but we haven't had any for a while. So if you want to be that person who leaves us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening to this, Apple is like a place that we can definitely find them easily though. That would be amazing. And thank you so much for listening. We want to thank Hembry as always for intro and outro song, Reach Out. And you can find Decision Space now on Instagram. So check us out there. We're also, uh, all of our episodes are available online at Decision Space Podcast. Dot com. Thanks so much and see you next week. Bye, y'all. Bye.